We're here at AEW Unrestricted. I'm Aubrey Edwards here with my awesome co-host, Tony Schiavone. I'm pointing down on the video like I know what the format is, but it's fucking Zoom. Who knows? Um, <laughs> wow. We're here. An, an F-bomb in the first paragraph. I, I mean, I'm just giving people what they want, right? Or what they don't Apparently. want. So okay. who knows, right? Awesome. So today on the podcast, we've got a very special guest, someone I'm uh, particularly excited to talk about, and as well as like Twitter, because I asked for questions and I think I got the most responses I've ever gotten. But we've got Jeremy here today, who's the partner and president of Jazzwares. Uh, and I mean, you probably know him as the guy who's making the AEW action figures happen. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Listen, Jeremy Pidauer, straight out of L.A., making wow. figures left and right. But uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, it, I'll tell you what, it's uh, it's truly an honor to work with uh, with you guys to work for to work with AEW um, and uh, Jazzwares as an organization could not be happier uh, about having the opportunity. So thank you for having me here today and thank you for allowing us as a company to do this. Uh, again, we're talking with Jeremy Padauer, and, and Jeremy, you were the uh, uh, founder of a uh, Wicked Cool Toys, and so you've been in this you've been in this business quite a while, haven't you? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, so yeah, no partner at uh, Wicked Cool Toys and Jazzwares, and I've been in this business uh, for over twenty years. As a matter Damn. of fact, as a matter of fact, in nineteen eighty nine, in high school, I started my toy career working on a toy aisle and hemming kids' clothing. On the side. So I, I was doing everything I could to try to get myself in the toy aisle, but I started off by uh, making sure that kids look good in the clothes that they wore to try to spend <laughs> at least an hour a day selling some toys. But yeah, no, it's been a lifelong pursuit for me. Uh, you, uh, former Mattel Toys brand manager, uh, got your MBA at Vanderbilt. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, uh, I did. So yeah. I, yes, sir. Uh, that means you're a debutante. Uh, let's see, co-creator and executive producer of animated series Monsuno, uh, which was on Nickelodeon. And now we want to talk about your relationship with All Elite Wrestling and Tony Khan. Talk about how that partnership uh, was created, how it came together. Yeah, so, you know, I, I am a student of the wrestling game. Um, and I, I'm lucky enough that, uh, that I grew up in a region of the country, Memphis and Mississippi in that area, that wrestling was very important in a time where wrestling was very specifically uh, cherished. Uh, and I would say it is today again. Uh, but when I was growing up, it was the biggest thing in town. So um, I spent a lot of time uh, learning the regional wrestlers and, and understanding the ins and outs of that. So when I, when I was in uh, graduate school, I got recruited to Mattel, as you mentioned. And after a few years there, I went to another company to head up their wrestling business. Uh, so I've been uh, making wrestling action figures since 2002. And uh, what I would say to you guys is just in terms of uh, the AEW line, as soon as I heard that the Khan family was involved with launching a new organization, my mindset was, okay, the first element is in place to recreate the Ted Turner, Vince McMahon type opportunity. The first element being uh, capital. You have to have a lot of capital to run an organization like this in the right way. Right? The second element is, do you have the distribution of content? And as soon as I saw that there was some potential of a content distribution deal, I reached out to as many people as I possibly could to see if I could get in touch with Tony Khan or people within the organization. Because the third element, which is also as crucial, is that the creative is great. So I knew that the capital was there. I knew that the distribution was coming into play. And then it came down to creative. And after having several conversations, I recognized that it would be an enormous mistake if we didn't dive into this with, uh, with our heart and soul. I mean, it's pretty clear looking at the action figures that you guys are very, very closely, like from an emotional standpoint, attached to the product because... Every single little detail is just insane. I think I was actually talking to Dakota, who's Dustin's daughter, saying like, yeah, the tattoo of my face looks very accurate on my dad's arm. <laughs> like little things <laughs> like that. It's just kind of crazy. Um, well, thank you. When, you. when you make action figures, the key is authenticity, especially when you're reaching out to a collector. And what you will find, I'll give you a stat that might be surprising for you. 
But uh, if you go to the action figure aisle, it's a multi-billion dollar aisle, of which approximately 40% of the intended recipients are over the age of 13. So they're not toys as much as they're collectibles, depending on the brand. Now, if you're looking at Spider-Man, it may be 90% uh, kid. But if you're looking at something like the wrestling figs, uh, it could be 60% adult collector. So for us, again, we know that authenticity has to be 100% bang on for us to be competitive. And then the objective is how far above and beyond can we take it? That's awesome. So speaking of uh, authenticity and just collectors in general, I know that when I've previously collected figures and stuff, like the packaging is such a key part of it and just making sure that that's clean and crisp and whatnot. Uh, what's your, like, ha- talk, talk about the design inspiration for something like packaging. Yeah, no, so when it, comes to, when it comes to the presentation, you want people to be able to make a choice. Either they're going to have the opportunity to play with the figs, take them out of package and play, or display in package. They call it mint, mint on card, MOC, right? Because the objective is to never overship a wave so that when people buy these things, they'll have secondary market value later on. Like some of the figures that, that I was involved with making 20 years ago sell in the secondary market for five grand. Like there's a Ric Flair employee edition that we made that mm. uh, we, we did a limited edition run on classic superstars uh, back in the day. And that, that, if you can find that for 5,000, you, you just buy it. Uh, so it's very important from a, from a packaging standpoint to create something that people will cherish and that could have secondary market value. That's insane. <laughs> So let's talk about the uh, the Unrivaled series. How did we come up with the name Unrivaled, Jeremy? So I, I love segmenting brands with names that seem fitting. And uh, the one thing that I noticed about AEW is that the spirit there at the organization feels unparalleled to anything that I've seen. The partnership, the collaboration is at a different level than anything that I've seen. Um, and so... We just went through and brainstormed words that sort of felt like unparalleled or those things and unrivaled felt like it was it it just kept hitting the top of the food chain because it sort of not only described what we feel you guys are accomplishing, but also it described the spirit of the organization. The current line of AEW unrivaled, the action figures has Chris Jericho, Cody Brandy, the, uh, the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick. And Kenny Omega, which, uh, doesn't that come with a Chris Jericho figure? Yes. Yes. So there's... How, wh- why did they come together? Because of their great rivalry? Oh, <laughs> so, so, there, so there are multiple Chris Jericho figures in the first wave. There's one that's in something called uh, a Bubbly, which uh, essentially right. is like this champagne-looking package. Right. And then there is a Chris Jericho figure in the regular assortment. But no, we, we sold every figure uh, standalone in the right. first wave. And what we're also going to do, because of the very significant early success that we're seeing at retail, it's very clear that we need to do things like two packs and tag teams and rivalries and uh, also bring the figures together in that way. I, I know you, obviously, you, you've got a lot of photographs, and a lot of video that you can go by, but how much did the guys and girls like Brandy have an input into their look? So absolutely, the first wave was really focused on the initial pay-per-view that you guys put out that was pretty spectacular. So we took, we took the approach primarily that we would take assets from that pay-per-view and celebrate it. Um, not all, but most. And uh, I, I'd say that there was very, uh, a significant amount of buy-in from uh, talent that was that that said you know that seems very appropriate so how do you end up capturing the likeness of each performer because i know we've talked a little bit about details and just capturing all of that but like i know i got my face scanned at one point or another so how does that whole thing work (laughs) so it used to so you know 20 years ago when we did this there would be like literally you'd like bring a robot to uh, a thing that weighed a zillion pounds and it would scan a 360 all the way around someone Um, And it was heavy and it was cumbersome and it was sort of like this enormous, like you have to stay still for a zillion minutes and, you know, maybe we'll capture the likeness. 
nowadays, as you noticed, it was a very different experience. It was faster. It was a smaller unit. It was something that could capture your likeness on a 360 element. But uh, essentially what happens is we, we take a computer scan and then we hire uh, or we work with internal sculptors who clean it up and bring it to a, a 3D uh, element, a sculpt that we then use to uh, as the basis of our figural line and we tool it up. So these tools that we create are literally, you know, giant, I would say, metal plates that have the impression of the sculpt in the plate that you can fill the cavity with with you know little plastic pellets that sh form the shape of your likeness and and essentially it's as it's as straightforward as that it goes from scan to clean up to sculpt to tool it's an amazing process uh and and obviously you know you talked about how uh, the scan has changed the the I would think, maybe I'm wrong, because of all the intricacies that you have now and how things look and how detailed they are, that the actual process of building these have changed as well, right? I would say so. Um, although, interestingly enough, uh, the manufacturing process, although it becomes more efficient, is very familiar over the yeah. years. The, the one thing that I will say has changed is the application of deco. So if you can imagine... Uh, there's a lot of hand painting that goes on one of these action figures. People who are in a line, like you can think of that, the old Ford factories back in the day, they created the whole idea of, uh, of that type of production run. But one person will paint the eye, the next person will paint the eyebrow, and then it goes down a process to make sure that people who are absolutely nailing it and getting it perfect. Whereas today, there's something called DIJ printing. It's like direct inkjet printing, where the tool is lined up in a plate and it literally psh, sprays a perfect mask onto the face. Uh, and it does save some steps. And honestly, as certain, you know, look, in, 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 depending on where you manufacture, and most action figure manufacturing is done overseas, um, as these countries create a larger middle class, there are fewer skilled workers to do those types of jobs. So it is great that there is the opportunity that, that technology uh, can cover some of those opportunities. That's insane. I know that in addition to the figures, we've also got a replica uh, of our world championship. Yes. Which is phenomenal. <laughs> like the detail work in that is is extremely well done, just like all the rest of the figures. Do you guys have any plans to do additional titles? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, not only will we do additional titles, but we were talking yesterday, uh, what we'd like to do is that you know, look, we're going to sell a lot of AEW figures. And in general, there are a lot of wrestling figures sold every year. It, millions and millions of figures sold every year. So we thought, what would happen if we did, like, smaller die cast and, like, pleather belts for the figures themselves instead of just doing the PVC plastic type belts? So we're not only thinking in terms of doing more belts, but we want to do them in various ways that are super special that make, you know the fans excited and make the talent excited because at the end of the day, you know, we know that, that this is a very personal thing for people to have an action figure of themselves. I mean, and goodness, it's one of the things that you probably think about when you're a kid and you're looking at the aspirational elements of going into this business. So we take it very seriously and we, we want the end consumer to be happy, but we also really want the talent to be super pleased with what they get. Okay, you've announced the Unrivaled Series uh, 2, uh, Moxley, MJF, Lucha Bros, Dustin, Hangman. Uh, can you tell us about the Unrivaled Series 3? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I will tell you that, uh, that let's see, we, while we've announced uh, Darby and we've announced okay. Orange Cassidy. All right. And um, in terms of some of the other, I will say that you can expect some additional announcements soon in terms okay. of who's going to be in it. I wouldn't be surprised to see Sammy soon. Sure. I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, some of the, some of the, the uh, remarkable uh, female athletes in your organization who need to be celebrated. Um, and uh, just in terms of what's coming up next, goodness, uh, my philosophy has always been to celebrate the entire roster. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the challenges that you have coming right out of the gate is that you tend to focus on one figure all line. So we're doing unrivaled. But ultimately, the objective would be to have multiple figure all lines 
happening at once. So a single pack, a two pack, maybe something for grocery and drug channel where you can really go into uh, not just, you know, the main event talent, but you're doing talent that may even be doing primarily dark uh, matches because ultimately a collector and a fan wants to play out the entire experience. Sure. So they they want Tony, they want Aubrey, they want all of these things to be able to play out the entire experience. Sure. We're talking with Jeremy Padauer, who, of course, is with Jazzwares. He's the president of Jazzwares. And, of course, out now is the AEW Unrivaled Collection, and that is uh, number one. And we'll be talking. We, he mentioned that he was a wrestling fan himself. We're going to talk about that and how he got indoctrinated into our great sport, and also talk about his uh, his own personal collection right after this. One thing I'd like to talk about is State Farm Insurance. And I say I'd like to talk about that because I've been a State Farm customer, a member, if you will, since 1981, since the year that I was married. State Farm has surprisingly great rates on both auto and homeowners. Tony, you've been a member of State Farm since before I was born. There you go. That means that they must have like great customer service. They've got yes, they agents do. available everywhere. Like to be a member of a company for that long, you have to be really, really happy with their policies. I'm happy with their policies. And now I'm happier, Aubrey, with their easy to use technology. Because back then, you'd have to have the insurance card in your wallet. It was a paper insurance card or like a cardboard insurance card. Now you have it on your phone. You have, they have a great app and you have your insurance card right on your smartphone. So the technology that is advanced in the world has also advanced insurance in insurance thanks to our people at State Farm. So you can manage your coverage, pay your bill, file a claim all just from your phone. Some That's you already right. carry around with you. Who That's needs right. cardboard cards anymore? Jeez. No boy. A, a great <laughs> price with even greater service. So Aubrey, as I always say, when you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You say that all the time, Tony. I do. We're here with Jeremy Padauer from Jazzwares, company behind the new AEW action figure line. We've been talking about the Unrivaled Series 1, the development process of action figures. But one of the things that Jeremy mentioned is that he's a big wrestling fan and always has been. So what was your first introduction to wrestling and like the first live event you ended up going to? So I, I've been a fan since I was a really little kid. But uh, so I would say I became very engaged and interested in wrestling, maybe by the age of five or six years old. Um, and that would have been the late 70s. Uh, but the the most uh, what strikes me uh, as maybe the most memorable thing that happened to me as a little boy is that I was probably about eight. And this was in Columbus, Mississippi. And there's an, uh, an auditorium there that I couldn't even tell you the name of it anymore. And Ric Flair was coming out and. Uh, you know, you guys are probably familiar with, you know, the regional and smaller venues that, you know, you could really approach these the talent as they were, you know, ripping the 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 curtain open and coming out. Well, Ric Flair came to town and I found my way with my little uh, instant camera to the front of the curtain. So right as Ric Flair opened the curtain. I was standing there and I flash photography to him, eight years old. So he couldn't see what was behind the flash, but he threw his hand out in front of him. And I took a second shot as I was flying through the air. And all you can see is Ric Flair's angry face in his hand and like my feet and uh, a, a, a camera shot. So to me, that was the moment that I was like, you know what, if I can turn this into part of my life, even if I'm on the periphery of it, I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it goes all the way back, and and uh, I, I actually took a bump, and it was uh, and that was the only one, but I'm still proud of it. <laughs> Wait a minute, you took a bump. You have to expand on that. You can't yeah. just say I took a bump and just let it let it go by. Look, I took a bump because uh, so, because Flair Flair like when he threw his arms out. Oh, he, that he, bump. Okay, he caught me. That was the bump I took. <laughs> okay, was his, he paid his dues right out of all the right. gate. I paid my dues. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> How did, was that the first live wrestling event you'd ever gone to? I, I would say that it was amongst the first, yes. I, I never I never had the opportunity really to go to like a national company's event because right. I was more living in smaller towns. 
Uh, and as I got older, then I got to see, you know, the, you know, a, a WCW or WWF event live. But for me, there was really nothing like the spirit of regional wrestling, which is one of the reasons why I got to tell you, I'm especially excited about the open challenge that, that Cody hosts, because it does, it, it gives talent an opportunity to showcase themselves that otherwise may not. And it gives consumers the opportunity to see things and fans to see things that they may not have otherwise uh, seen. Sure. So it's, it's really cool to see. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. I think it's this open challenge is, is a great thing for not only us, but for for pro wrestling around the world, independent wrestling, it, it really is good for all of it. So now you're at, you, you mentioned Columbus, Mississippi. So you grew up yeah. with Mid South Wrestling? I did. And I grew up with uh, Jerry Lawler as well. And yeah, USWA. Memphis Wrestling. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, Dave Brown and, uh, and Lance, that group. Lance, Lance oh yeah. my gosh. Lance Russell actually just recently passed. Right. He was uh, 90, I believe, or 91. Yeah. Right. Um, and active on social media until the very end. Yeah. So, uh, uh, for you know, for me, um, again, when you're a kid, uh, and even when you're an adult, but but I think more when you're a kid, life is about identifying with people and finding things that are aspirational. And wrestling offers everything. It, it offers the bad guys, the good guys, uh, men and women who uh, take on different personas uh, as part of their personalities. And you can aspire to be like things that you can relate to. And so as a kid, it's, it's amazing what, how the psychology works. Uh, but it, it, it just, it offered a, a connectedness that you wouldn't otherwise have living in a small town. So for me, being able to be, to have access to all of these personas and personalities and even see them in person when the other heroes were certainly not visiting the town, uh, it just made it a whole next level sort of experience. So you also... And beyond just wrestling action figures, I know you're involved in a number of other massive brands. I think I've got listed Pokemon, Fortnite, Halo, Micro Machines, Roblox, and then looks like you won the 2018 Toy of the Year Award for Teddy Ruxpin. Yeah. Which I knew I that. grew up with the original Teddy Ruxpin, with the tape <laughs> in the back and the, the creepy yes. mouth movements. Like, like yes. that's, that's insane. That's how, like, obviously you're a big wrestling fan, but... What's what's the big difference between working with wrestling figures versus all these other brands? Well, so it's it truly has been a um, a remarkable uh, run based on passion, and I think I think you know just to start this part of the conversation, I would just say follow your dreams, follow the things that make you wake up and and be happy, because no matter what you do, it's going to be really really hard. So you might as well do something you love, because you're going to have to do something. Uh, and so for me, pursuing toys was always something that I did out of love and uh, coming out of a, a school, which, you know, uh, I did I did pay for myself. I'm proud to say this was I was there was no silver spoon going into Vanderbilt for me. Um, I was the kid working in the cafeteria to try to make it happen. But but coming out of there, it did give me a lot of options. So I got recruited to Mattel. And uh, and after uh, a certain amount of experience, I was ready to 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 launch a company with my partners. Uh, yeah. Over the last seven years, we've become one of the top 10 toy companies in the world. And by achieving that, um, it did take a lot of effort and a lot of big brands that that we've signed on. Pokemon is a very special scenario in that Pokemon actually invested in our company uh, and granted us the global rights to Pokemon right wow. before Pokemon Go launched. Oh, man. And, and if you don't believe that karma is real, here's how karma is real. Karma is real in that I managed the Pokemon business about seven years before. And so, and you can see the passion that someone has for something. And so karma is real in that people have a long memory. And when you do your best and when they see the passion and the effort, it's amazing what can come back to you later in life. And in this case, Pokemon came back to us. Uh, and, 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 and once we had Pokemon signed, it allowed us to go and get business with Microsoft and AEW and Hasbro with Micro Machines. And then, of course, the acquisition by Jazzwares and all the wonderful things that have happened since then. So, uh, yeah, it's incredible. And while it may seem like I'm entirely focused and obsessed with AEW, and I am, there's a lot of other things that we're doing. 
Uh, but but frankly speaking, nothing nothing is more to my heart and soul than than wrestling. And what you guys are doing within the wrestling genre is about as impressive as as anything that's happened in the last twenty years. Let's talk about some of the figures and some of the uh, things that are out there that have been out there. What is the number one? If you can put a just list one, the number one action figure of all time, be it wrestling or some other comic books or whatever. I mean, I think I think the number one action figure of all time is the Star Wars series, mm. uh, because if you if you look at what it meant to the genre, it was pretty dramatic. So if you go back to 1975 and you walk down the toy aisle, if you go back with me that far, um, what you would find is some licensed product based on intellectual property that you might know. But primarily what you'll find is a hodgepodge. And after Star Wars, um, everything dramatically changed. Um, in fact, uh, here's an interesting thing for you. So even 20 years ago, uh, even at the earliest parts of my careers working for Mattel, um, fans of wrestling figures were kind of fanboys, fangirls, nerds, uh, 40-year-old virgins, uh, all that stuff. And you know what they're called today? Mainstream. Everybody. I guess what I'm saying is things have changed so dramatically in a period of time. And um, so I, I think Star Wars has a lot to do with it. And I think there's been an evolution over time. But wrestling is interesting because it's very similar to Star Wars in that there's a very broad set of characters. There's a very broad set of personalities and looks. Um, it changes all the time in terms of the content always reinforces new looks, new, new styles, new gimmicks, new, new characters. And you can create a lot of breadth of line with both Star Wars and, and wrestling. So when I, in 2002, when I took over the wrestling business, and, and at the time it was WWE, we treated it like a collectible and not a toy. Right. And we drove breadth. And we started doing the classic superstar series, which was really all about the alumni and really celebrating the history. And I think that I think that there's a lot of similarities between wrestling and Star Wars in that regard. So, Jeremy, you're a uh, collector yourself, right? Yes, okay. big time. <laughs> what 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 do you collect? So I, I tend to collect uh, for several reasons. Uh, I collect things that I love and I collect things that I believe will have a tremendous secondary market value increase. And so what I've focused a lot of my collecting on recently is Pokemon. And I'll tell you why. Uh, in 1999, Pokemon was bought, brought to the United States and launched here and became the single largest brand of all time. $90 billion in 22 years, 23 years in the U.S., 90 billion in, in the world, I should say, at retail. Star Wars is number two, to give you a sense of scale. But the kids who were 6 to 12 Damn. years old, the kids who were 6 to 12 years old in 1999 are in their early 30s now. Mm -hmm. And the cards, the original cards from 99, are escalating in value very, very quickly. So as a collector, that appeals to me because I get to do something that I like and I don't have to trust our... Stock market, which I don't trust at all right now. No. Sure. And so, so I've put hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into Pokemon cards in the last year, and I've seen a remarkable return. And in my opinion, as these kids go from being age 30 to age 40 to age 45, watch what happens to the high-grade original cards. Uh, they will continue to go significantly higher. And, and to give you one more comparison, sports cards have been around for 100 years or more. Sports cards have actually been around 150 years. And the valuations mm -hmm. at the high end of sports cards are many, 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 many multiples, the valuations at the high end of trading card games like Pokemon. But just wait, because a generation from now, I think that that will not be the case anymore. I think that you'll see that there'll be enough age and enough seasoning uh, in terms of the people who are into those types of cards and games that will bring a, those types of trading card games to the level of sports cards. Um, and, and, and just one additional thing. 
I am also a big fan of wrestling cards. In fact, I, I just completed the 1973 wrestling annual cards. And there's a set from 1982 called the Wrestling All-Stars, which just had a Hulk Hogan card sell for $20,000. Whoa. Single card. Yeah. Amazing, right? <laughs> wow. You uh, collect baseball cards, too? You like baseball cards? I do. I, I'm a big fan of, of baseball cards. Uh, and frankly speaking, there's been a, a set recently that Topps just put out called Topps Project 2020. And all, what that is, is it is they've, they've basically partnered with 20 very well-known artists, and they're recreating uh, 20 of their key rookie cards throughout time mm -hmm. through the eyes of each one of these artists. So they're, they're actually creating uh, a really cool business, and I've been, I've been buying those cards up recently. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, and, and I'm a baseball card collector. Oh! And uh, I, just, uh, I just got in, uh, Tops 1969 was what I bought off Street and Smith's back when I was young. Nice! And so I just, uh, I just got off eBay. Uh, they had these foil cards, a part of the collection. American League was like in blue and uh, National League was like in red. And I just, I found the entire series of that and just, I ordered it off eBay recently. But I was really, I'm, I'm really big into any card that is pre-Upper Deck. Okay, you know? so anything prior to like 89. So yeah, you're, you're exactly. Like, right. And because so they, 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 ruined, they ruined the business, didn't they? Really? You know what happened? I, I think the business ruined the business. Essentially, okay. what happened was in, in the in like ninety in like eighty six eighty seven, there was this huge rush of interest into the card market, mm -hmm. partially due to a twenty twenty special that they talked about the valuation of cards going up dramatically, and uh, and there was just a flood of new card manufacturers, including right. Upper Deck, mm -hmm. Bowman, Sports Flicks, Score, like. Right. Like there were so many you couldn't even straighten your head out. Sure, but in I'd say in the last ten years, the last fifteen years, there's been a lot of sense made of it. Um, in that the new card manufacturers really know how to create excitement over super limited edition items. So you'll see autographed items and right. other things that sell for premium. Right, and then the grading system. So Tony, I don't know if you get involved with like PSA or BGS or any of the grading systems that are out there. No, I, I, I subscribe to Beckett online, but I don't do any of the grading systems. Well, the, the grading makes it very uh, reliable and very fluid in terms of pricing. So to give you an idea, uh, if you have a 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle rookie mm -hmm. and it's in a grade of five, the card may, be, may sell for thirty dollars or $40,000. Right. But if it's in a grade of 10... Which mm -hmm. there's only three, then mm -hmm. the card's worth fifteen million dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so to put things in perspective, right? The grading system in the card game has changed everything because what okay. it what it does is it creates scarcity amongst the highest grades, and at the end of the day, scarcity is what drives valuation. Mm -hmm. If only three people can have the perfect condition thing, it ends up being three really passionate billionaires who are fighting each other to try to get them. Wow. Damn. Well, for me, it's just reminding me of my childhood. I, <laughs> I don't see, you know, I, I don't, I don't really get them for, you know, obviously for uh, monetary reasons. I get them for, gosh, I remember that card and I remember peeling off, you know, the, uh, the sticker or the, the gum or whatever. And that's what, that's why I'd collect them. Well, Tony, me back. at some point, what you have to do, is you have to take some photos of some of your stuff and send it okay. to me okay. so that I can tell you, because you might want to get some of those memories graded, because some of those memories might be worth a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> there you go. I know I had a full collection of the first run of Pokemon cards that I just gave to, like, my eight-year-old niece that I'm, I might need to, oh. like, get you those back. You need to back. find her today, yeah. She <laughs> was that's like, right. hey, Melina, I'm sorry. Okay. Auntie, <laughs> Auntie needs these back. All right. <laughs> We're talking to Jeremy Pidauer about action figures, wrestling, collecting, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm excited to uh, start asking you some some Twitter questions in just a oh, minute. Oh, boy. This is AEW Unrestricted. We're talking to Jeremy Padauer, man behind AEW action figures. It just came out last week. Uh, we've, we've asked a lot of people on Twitter, like, do you have any questions? And this was probably our most 
interactive and uh, most responsive uh, uh, one uh, solicitation for questions yet for very obvious reasons. Everyone's real excited about it. So I'm just going to jump through and kind of ask a couple of these. We've got uh, one of the questions that I'm most interested in that I actually end up seeing a lot. Uh, we got this from Women's Wrestling on Twitter. Can we get more women's fixture, figures? I know Brandy's like touting right now that she's the only one with a figure, but are we going to see more women? Yes, no question about that. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, um, we will see uh, more women's figures. We will see women's figures in the single packs. We'll see exclusives. We'll see limited editions. We'll see two packs. So, yeah. And, and frankly speaking, I watched the YouTube um, uh, tag team uh, first round yes. uh, action and uh, blown away by the by the breadth of talent within that division. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because there's been an evolution here in terms of the way um, the perception of, I would say, women in terms of wrestling and in terms of fighting in general. Mm -hmm. And not only in wrestling, but MMA has truly changed the way people perceive. And essentially what I would say is a bunch of testosterone guys have really underestimated the story strength and the toughness of women and when you see i mean by the way you just proved it right there but <laughs> by flexing no Throwing but, the but double by double buy. yeah no but but if you see what's <laughs> like mma and you see now i think remember, there was a time where they wouldn't even host uh female fights but now it's main event time and it's happening across all fight genres including wrestling so no there's Women will not be overlooked uh, in this line, um, and especially as we start to roll out the other uh, lines of figures, um, you'll see, uh, like I said, men, women, everyone celebrated as athletes and as, uh, and as professionals. We have a question from uh, Ben Ellis uh, on Twitter. It's at Ben CGS. How soon can we expect the AEW figures to be available in the U.K.? Um, later this year, um, we should, but we, we have distribution there. Um, we should be having, I believe it's Smith's and, uh, it should be later this year. And I'm not sure if it's for wave two or whether they're capturing some of wave one. I believe they are capturing some of wave one. I've got a question from Mahoney413 on Twitter. What's the process for putting together a series lineup? Series one and two are both unbelievable lineups. Uh, he also said, thank you for everything you've done for wrestling figures. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, here's, the, here's the dirty secret, okay? Uh, and this is what happens once you get past wave one and two, basically, is that you want to treat a wrestling lineup the way you treat macroeconomics, okay? In a sense, it's supply and demand by character. And you can do that by looking at the, and I'll never reveal who's who, but by looking at the lineup and saying, okay, you have A-level main event, you have B-level mid-card, and you have C-level who still need to be celebrated because they could be A-level by the time you blink, right? And essentially what you do is you set it up to where there is a certain amount of supply of each one of those figures in, in the master cartons that you're shipping out. So th look at it this way. When you ship a box to retail, there's a certain number of figures that go in that box. And you can really manage the supply of the A, B, and C level characters to make them all as exciting to the end consumer by not overproducing B and Cs. And at the end of the day, what it does is it allows you to have a much broader lineup and it allows things like eBay later on to be very, very excited about what's going on across the entire line, and it allows you to develop a broader sense of character. So, yeah, if we put every made of Inter out, every wave, we would sell a lot of figures, but people get bored of that over the course of time. You need to celebrate the entire roster, and that's what's going to happen over, over time. Uh, at Orlando Russell on Twitter wants to know, any chance of getting a medium-scale ring of 18 by 18 and uh, are refs, cameramen, interviewers going to get their figures? So let's start with that. We'll start there. The answer is yes, we absolutely have to. 
And that's the reason why at some point I just want to hold a camera at an event for five seconds so that I can qualify. Uh, but other than that, yes, the people in front of the camera, Tony, Aubrey, all you guys, you need to be celebrated. Um, and so we're going to take a very broad approach in terms of the way we celebrate uh, the event. In fact, we'll, in, we'll, do, we'll do the stage at some point. We'll do, you know, the desks. We'll do where you guys sit. We'll do what? Well, because ultimately people want to have the entire display. And don't get me wrong. A lot of people play with their figures. Um, now, the second part to that question is something that I've completely forgotten. So what was that? So the, the part of it was, are you going to celebrate the people? And what was the other part? Oh, 18 by 18 ring. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so 18 by 18. So essentially what we've done is we've started with an everyday $20 ring, which is, I would say, the smaller size ring, although it's pretty sizable. And then we've done a collector ring, which is very sizable. It's like this, I don't even know what it is, 24 by 24, 26 by 26. And they're asking a question about something that I did, you know, 12 years ago with another wrestling brand. And the answer is yes. Over the course of time, we should do a mid-level ring. And that ring should include accessories that don't otherwise come in the other ring. So the answer is yes. And give us some time because we've got to earn more space at retail because uh, that's the way the game works. We have a question on Twitter. I'm going to mispronounce it, so I'll just spell it out. The S-U-V-A-C-I. Uh, will Marco Stunt and Lance Archer figures be of same height and scale? <laughs> <laughs> will they be of the same height and scale? Listen. Proportionally, given their, oh, their oh, real-life yeah, yeah. counterparts. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, we will... Yes. We will so one thing that I did um, back in the day uh, is w did not do a great job on scale. Um, and it's something, again, wrestling figures have evolved tremendously over the years. If you remember back at the very beginning, the LJN figures of the early 80s were just big rubber figures with no articulation. Yep. And then it evolved to the Hasbro figures, which were these little squat figures that you could pull back an arm and it would punch forward. Mm -hmm. And each generation of action figures brought its own level of detail and so the the figures that i developed back in the day did not keep scale as honest as we do today so yes yeah, scale will be something that we take very very seriously today and uh, and that figure and that question goes right to the heart of that uh paul riot riles who's on twitter at paul riot riles wants to know will we get and he talked about the ring already will we get entrance stages and backstage interview areas Boy, he really wants to play it all out. Oh, boy. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no. Uh, interest stages are actually pretty easy. Uh, what we won't do is we probably won't do a giant big plastic slab that costs you a fortune to buy. But we can do things that allow you that that get that there's corrugate. There's 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 ways to do this with really solid like cardboard that won't like easily break that allow you to have the scale that you want at the price point that you want where you don't have to spend an arm and a leg. Uh, and it's easy to ship and pack. So I, I definitely can see ways that we can accomplish what he, what they're asking for there. We have a question from AEW Collector on Twitter. Obviously someone who is a big fan of collecting uh, yes. unrivaled characters. Uh, they asked the question, for someone with no experience in the toy business that wants to get involved but doesn't have a clue on which direction to go to get involved, what's the first thing you would recommend? I mean, that's, that's sort of me. I mean, I, I, I didn't have connections and I didn't have uh, specific uh, experience. Um, but um, I would say for me, it was, you know, continuing on paying for my education. Uh, specifically, I focused on marketing and brand management. Um, it also um, in 1990, in the late 90s, um, I was very entrepreneurial and I in, like 95. I was very early with the Internet. And I created a series of websites where you could buy and sell product online. And then I faked out Yahoo. Yahoo was nothing more than a phone book. So if you named everything with two A's, then you'd be the first listed under every categorical listing, right? So, so basically what I'm saying to you is be entrepreneurial, pursue your passions. So I had absolute Beanie Babies, absolute Furby, absolute this and that. I didn't know anything about toys, from a selling toy standpoint, but I knew I wanted to be involved and I figured out ways to be involved. And so when I, when I graduated, uh, Mattel found me incredibly interesting uh, and it's very competitive. So go out there and be in the toy industry, start an eBay page, do what you have to do, 
but start, be involved. I imagine it's the same way you get involved in the wrestling business. Is it just go out there and do it? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Go get it done. Take the initiative. Um, and be unrelenting. I mean, just it's the way I was. So, and it's, and I'm thinking about when I started doing wrestling, how much more is available to people who want to get into it now because of the internet and oh, things yeah. and oh, the yeah. communication we have today. So, uh, one uh, last thing before we let you go, Jeremy, uh, you, uh, you can follow you on Twitter at Jeremy com on Instagram at Jeremy Padauer, but you also have scavenger hunts on Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. And award cash prizes. How did that all start? Well, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career. Um, and, uh, and I, I love giving back to fans and consumers and collectors. And so, especially during COVID. So I, uh, very often on my own personal Twitter, this isn't, uh, this isn't, um, you know, company stuff. It's just me trying to give back. And, right. uh, you know, like it could be, you know, a mint on card, uh, dusty roads from the old Hasbro series, which was a thousand dollars and it gave it to a frontline worker. Uh, or it could be a scavenger hunt where the first person that comes to me after a series of clues on eBay, uh, finds the, the item that I'm talking about, they get it. Um, but whatever it is, it's really just, a, it's just a goodwill, man. It's just, it's just something that, that I feel a real responsibility for because I'm still asking people to buy stuff. Sure. Uh, at a time that is very difficult and we're very grateful and thankful. And in, as an individual, I'm also very grateful and thankful and just want to have fun with people who have shown so much love to me. Well, there, there needs to be more goodwill in the world and thank goodness you're a part of that, Jeremy. And, uh, it, it's great to have you part of AEW. It really is your, your passion, your enthusiasm for us and for the industry shows and, uh, the, uh, the toys are now available at Walmart and I believe ringsidecollectibles.com. Is that correct? You got it. You got All it. Right. That's exactly right. All right. Jeremy, Thanks for your time. thank you so much for being here today. Like, it's pretty clear your passion just matches all the passion we've got at AEW. So I'm so, so glad this partnership came together because it's clearly a match made in heaven. So Thank you. It is. We... Uh, over the moon, truly. Thank you. All right. You can subscribe to our podcast, AEW Unrestricted, wherever you get your podcasts. And that is for free. And please give us a rating and review. We'd love to hear from you, wouldn't we, Aubrey? We absolutely would. You can also watch AEW Dynamite Wednesdays at 8, 7 Central on TNT. Watch along. Tweet at us. We're, uh, we're obviously super excited to just have everybody as a part of this community. And God, I'm so, I'm so excited for these toys. I haven't gone out to Walmart yet. <laughs> I'm Aubrey Edwards. This is Tony Schiavone. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you again, Jeremy.